Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Welcome to the GNS Best Products at NASA CDDIS for disaster monitoring, crustal deformation, extreme weather, and other applications Earth Data webinar. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. It is 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, so we are going to go ahead and get started here. I will begin today's webinar with just a few logistics to ensure the best audio experience. All participants have been placed in silent mode, but if you have any issues or you have any questions, what I'd like for you to do is enter those into the Q&A panel rather than the chat, and you should find both the Q&A panel and the chat panel on the right side of your screen. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording will be posted both to the NASA Earth Data website and also to the NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a week of completion. Once completed, what I'll do then is I'll send an email to all registrants with the recording links and also include a link to the presentation slide decks used within today's webinar. As far as timing is concerned, today's webinar will be one hour and 15 minutes long with one hour allocated to the presentation and demonstrations and an additional 15 minutes for the question and answer period. During today's webinar, we will have three speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Patrick Michael. He is the ma manager, excuse me, of NASA's Crustal Dynamics Data Information System, or CDDIS. Our second speaker is Dr. Yehuda Bach, the director of Scripps Orbit and Permanent Array Center at the University of California, San Diego. And our third speaker for this afternoon is Dr. Angeline Moore, who is a scientist within the Ionospheric and Atmospheric Remote Sensing Group at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory the California Institute of Technology. Let's pull up the agenda here. Patrick will begin today's, excuse me, let's pull up the agenda here. <laughs> Patrick will begin today's webinar by providing an introduction to NASA's Space Geodesy Archive, CDDIS, and also geodesy data. We will then, tra then transition to Yehuda, who will provide an introduction to the suite of GNSS-derived data products that are part of the ESIS NASA Measures Project, and speak to a number of data applications and use cases for these products. Finally, our last speaker, Dr. Angeline Moore, will introduce Trumpospheric GNSS products and also provide a live demonstration for the MGVIS tool. Once Angeline has finished with her presentation, what we'll do then is we will transition to an optional final set of polls. I will give these polls approximately five minutes before we transition to the Q&A session, but the questions will be open for much longer for those of you who may wish to provide feedback. And then from there, what we'll do is we'll jump directly to the Q&A period. Depending upon the volume of questions that are received, we will extend the Q&A period an additional 15 minutes from end time for those of you who may wish to stay on the line with a hard cutoff of 3.15 p.m. And just a quick note about the Q&A period, we will try to answer all questions within the time allotted, but if we are not able to address your question during Q&A, our speakers will follow up with you offline. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Dr. Patrick Michael. So at this point, I am going to stop sharing. I will toss the sharing roll down to Sandra and unmute Patrick, and we can get going here. So give me just one second. Okay, Sandra, you should have presenter privileges. And now let me unmute Patrick. Would you give me one moment here? Okay, Patrick, you should be unmuted at this point. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I want to I want to say thank you for everybody that's showing up here this morning, this afternoon, this evening. Uh, we have a couple few minutes of uh, introductions, and then uh, I have to apologize. I'm having some technical problems on my side, so Sandra's running the slides for me. But with that, uh, I want to say good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone. No matter where you're at in the world today, I just want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend this webinar. I am Patrick Michael the manager for the Crustal Dynamics Data Information System, CDDIS. And CDDIS is one of the 12 NASA Distributive Active Archive Centers supporting NASA's Earth Science mission. As such, CDDIS is primarily responsible for the archiving and distribution of space geodesy and geodynamical data and products. Geodesy is the science of the measurement and representation of the Earth, and space geodesy is that study from space. An easy way I like to remember geodesy is 
the statement, where you have been, where you are at, and where are you going, science. There will be a link in the chat that will direct you to a couple minute NASA video about the history of geodesy that will give you some details on how the science of geodesy, which by the way is one of the oldest science disciplines, has developed and progressed over the years. It's our hope today that this webinar will give you an overview of areas that geodesy is used within our society and a specific example of how that science is being applied to better society as a whole. Next slide, please. Okay, CETUS is the only archive center in the world that currently carries data from all four primary space geodesy techniques, which are the Global Navigation Satellite Systems, GNSSS, which you are probably more familiar with, with the U.S. constellation, the GPS, or the European Galileo, or the Russian GLONASS system, or even the Chinese Beidou system. We also have satellite and lunar laser ranging. That is where we actually take lasers and, and and take the distance directly measurements very, very accurately between the Earth's surface and the moon and uh, satellites that are orbiting Earth. Very long baseline interferometry, which are really very large radio telescopes that are looking at quasars and determining the, the, dis, the, the change in very minute differences in time when the signal arrives, arrives from a quasar and how that works with the Earth's movement. And then finally, Doppler orbitography and radio position integrated by satellite door systems, which is really a French system, which is kind of like GPS, but for this talk of this talk, just kind of in reverse. From these four techniques, CDDIS works with the International Association of Geodesy and its sister services. So you can see that down below, that we have all those services. And one of those is the International GNSS Service, which we call the IGS. That's where all of our GNSS, all the GPS, GLONASS, and BEDO, uh, data comes from, the International Laser Ranging Service for all of our uh, laser ranging work, the International BLBI and Esperometry Service, the IDS, and finally the International DORA Service, the IDS. And from those services, we collect quality control, archive, and distribute data and products from over 1,500 sites covering the Earth. CDDS currently holds close to about a half a billion files of which almost 500 individual data and product sets are available to the public, and we distribute more than 2 billion files annually. And this data is used in various science endeavors, such as uh, precise orbit determination for satellites, even work in general relativity and other fundamental physics areas, determining the Earth's gravity, such as total mass and temporal variation of the Earth's center, atmospheric research, such as tropospheric delays, ionospheric electron counts, and even climate change. Also, publication of terrestrial reference frame, which is used in just about any spatially related science, such as sea level rise. And you can quickly see the geodesy touches a lot of science disciplines. So next slide, please. However, the data at CDDS is not restricted to just science work, but also to societal benefits as well. These areas typically fall into what I call five main categories, Earth observation, positioning, navigation, timing, and communications. From these categories, everything from natural disaster work, such as earthquakes and volcanoes, public safety, such as tsunamis, warnings, transportation, and aviation, agriculture, and even financial transactions and utilities use the CDDIS data. This breadth of uses gives CDDS a unique role in supporting both the science community and society as a whole. Next slide, please. So today, CDDS will be highlighting a subset of its data and product holdings from the Extended Solid Earth Science ESDR system, which we call the ES, ES, ES project, showcasing how this project provides the infrastructure, data, and products in support of natural and anthropogenic processes and hazards such as earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, extreme weather, climate change, and even sea level rise. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yehuda Bach and Dr. Angeline Moore, who will be presenting today in their ES, ES, ES project. Yehuda, over to you.
Thank you, Pat. It's a great introduction. I'm just going to set up my PowerPoint. Okay. So, so Dr. Bach, we can, there we go. Very good. Thank you so much. Can you see it okay? I certainly do. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, thank, thanks, Pat, again for the introduction. You uh, gave all the acronyms that I'm going to be using, so that, that's helpful. I will uh, repeat them again so people uh, get familiar with them. So hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Yehuda Bach, and I'm a researcher at the Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics at Scripps Institution of, Oceanogra of uh, Oceanography in La Jolla, California. Along with my partner, Angeline Moore, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, I'm pleased to present you an overview of our NASA Measures Project, Extended Solid Earth Science ESDR System. We provide, an on an operational basis, several levels of Earth Science data records, ESDRs, or otherwise just called products, for disaster monitoring, crustal deformation, extreme, hold on a second, let me, uh, I'm trying to, um, do you see, do you see me right now? Just want to turn that off. Okay. Let me go on. Yes, we do see you. Oh, I'm trying to turn it off. How do I do that here? Uh, stop sharing display. Okay. I believe you should be set. I have turned off your video. Thank you okay, so much. Thank you. Okay. So I was saying we provide on an operational basis several levels of earth science data records, we'll call products for disaster monitoring, crustal deformation, extreme weather and other applications using GNSS. These geodetic products, some extending over three decades, are regularly published at the CDDIS Distributed Archive, Active Archive Center, NASA's Archive of Space Geodetic Data. We'd like to acknowledge our project team at JPL and SIO and the CDDS team, in particular Sandra Blevins and the NASA EOS Disk Communications lead, Jennifer Brennan, for initiating and organizing this webinar. We'll start with a brief history of our collaboration with CDDIS, motivate our work, and describe the GNSS infrastructure that we take advantage of. Then we'll describe the four levels of ESDRs that are archived at CDDIS and present three examples of their use. Our collaboration extends over three decades. We've participated in the establishment in Southern California of the first continuous GNSS stations for earthquake science and as data and orbital analysis centers for the International GNSS Service. Since 2003, we've worked together on four consecutive NASA projects, providing products to the Earth science community and beyond. We are now in the concluding year of our current measures project and have proposed for another five years of funding. In the early 1990s, GNS networks for Earth science were first designed for quantifying and understanding crustal deformation and tectonic plate boundaries and associated earthquake hazards through measurements of movements of the Earth's surface. The last 30 years have seen many new science and societal applications. The emergence of the IGS for orbit determination, improved analysis software and methodologies, expansion of the navigation satellite constellations, innovations in receiver and antenna technology, enhanced computing and storage capabilities, and the emergence of data science as its own discipline. Today, there are thousands of continuously monitoring GNSS stations throughout the world, a 30-year collaboration of many people and institutions. For example, the Western US is highly instrumented with about 1,500 GNSS stations. 
a compendium of several networks listed on the bottom of the map. This super network has been an important focus of our measures projects. The positions of the stations are determined with respect to a precise, well-defined international terrestrial reference frame maintained by the International Earth Rotation and Reference System Service, IRS. The reference frame is defined by XYZ geocentric coordinates of a global network of GNSS stations and their motions over time. The XYZ coordinates can be converted to geodetic latitude and longitude and height with respect to a reference ellipsoid. Our project is primarily focused on the geodetic applications of GNSS. That is measuring changes in position or displacements on the Earth's surface with a resolution of 24 hours. On the left is a typical standalone GNSS station with equipment enclosures, solar panels with backup batteries, radio antenna for real-time data transmission, and an antenna protected by a ray dome. For stability and to achieve submillimeter precision, the tripod-like GNSS monument consists of five stainless steel rods driven to a depth of about 10 meters and isolated from the surface down to three meters. This station also includes a meteorological instrument for sensing water vapor in the atmosphere in a method called GNSS meteorology, which will be discussed later by Angeline. In addition, a MEMS accelerometer is attached to the vertical rod of the monument for measuring very high rate dynamic motions during seismic shaking by an optimal combination of geodesy and seismology, which we call seismogeodesy. As one example of the use of our products, we will also discuss the integration of GNSS and IMSAR displacements, that is interferometric synthetic aperture radar, which is a technique for mapping ground deformation using repeated radar images of the Earth's surface that are collected from orbiting satellites. Combining GNSS and IMSAR provides high resolution 3D images of displacement with respect to the International Terrestrial Reference Frame. This graphic developed by UNAFCO's Geodetic Facility for the Advancement of Geoscience shows some of the applications of GNSS, uh, the focus areas of our measures projects. These include tectonics and crustal deformation, meteorology, hydro, uh, hydrology, seismogeodesy, and calibration and validation. Throughout the presentation, we'll provide examples of these applications the data products used to support them and where you can find them at CDDIS. We are living in a period of increasingly extreme and frequent natural and anthropogenic hazards that we are all too familiar with. Changing our landscape, weather, and climate is becoming more difficult to make critical informed decisions regarding the safety of life and critical infrastructure. Geodetic data, methodologies, and operational capabilities developed under our NASA measures projects is our contribution to achieving a better understanding and mitigation of the effects of these hazards. We'll describe now the, the Earth Science data records produced by the measures project and archived and distributed at CDDIS. We produce four levels of ESDRs as summarized in this slide, starting with raw GNSS data. Each level builds upon the previous one, so that calibration and validation is a critical. As you'll see, this set of products reflects movements of the Earth's surface, but does not include dynamic motions that occur when the ground is shaking in an earthquake. Another of our products combines geodesy and seismology to measure both the dynamic shaking and permanent static motions at very high rates. CDDIS is the long-term repository for all our products. We also provide tools to access, manipulate, and visualize the ESDRs, as Angeline will show later. <clears throat> Here, we zoom in up to level two. The raw GNS data at level zero, collected in 24-hour segments, from thousands of stations are independently estimated 
by JPL and SIO with different GNSS software, but with a common set of data and metadata residing at the Scripps Orbit and Permanent Array Center. These analyses result in the level one raw di daily displacement time series. These are combined into a single level two set of daily station displacements after a process of rigorous calibration and validation to exclude outliers and artifacts. CalVal is critical at these levels for the integrity of the higher level products. We extend the time series weekly and store a new set at CDAS. Next, we'll present a few examples of daily displacement time series. Level zero involves an analysis of the raw carrier phase and pseudo range measurements at the two GPS L band frequencies collected at each station, as shown here. On the right are the raw daily G JPL and SIO displacements from April 1996 to August 2022 for station DHLG near the Salton Trough in a tectonically complex region at the southern end of the San Andreas Fault System, which also includes seismic swarms and areas of anthropogenic subsidence and tectonic uplift. These data are stored at the CDDIS link at the bottom of the slide. The corresponding CDDIS link will be shown for each of the measures projects. Note the offsets and nonlinear changes in the north, uh, east, and up directions in the raw displacement time series here. The center panel illustrates simply what we are trying to achieve with the level two CalVal combined daily displacements. That is, dis distinguishing transients from steady state motions after correcting for outliers and artifacts in the data. Discovering physical transients is critical for enhancing knowledge of the earth sciences and assess assessing associated hazards. The raw JPL and SIO displacements are combined into single time series that are fit by weighted squares for artifacts indicated by vertical black lines, instantaneous co-seismic offsets from three seismic events indicated by vertical orange lines, and estimate uh, station velocities and post-seismic decay. Post-seismic motions result from relaxation of the crust after an earthquake and a return to steady inter-seismic motion, a process that can last several years. The map on the left shows the horizontal velocities of the stations obtained from a parametric fit to the daily displacements. The HLG moves 23 millimeters in a mostly westward direction, while station P066 moves at a rate of 43 millimeters per year to the northwest. The plots on the right are detrended. That is, the estimated velocities are subtracted from the data to make sure the transients and co-seismic offsets are more apparent. Note that the artifacts due to changes in GPS antenna, in this case, have been removed. The transients include co-seismic motions and some nonlinear behavior between the three earthquakes. The root mean square error for each component reflects the precision of a single daily displacement. Here, one millimeter in the horizontal components over and three millimeters in the vertical component over a 26 year period. The velocities have a precision of less than a tenth of a millimeter per year. This is an extreme example of a level two displacement time series that contains artifacts. Here, due to the growth of vegetation nearly concealing the GNSS antenna, causing a significant drift in the north direction over a period of about two years until the vegetation is cleared in May 2018. Station history also shows an antenna offset and the effects of the 2019 magnitude 7.1 Ridgecrest earthquake in Central California. There are some stations like these that we exclude before calculating our level three and level four products, 
or trim some outlying data. This can be a laborious process, but is critical for obtaining the most robust and accurate products. This distinguishes our products from other community displacement time series that leave most of the CalVal to the user, a process that may take several months for a typical researcher. The level three products are the estimated parameters from the least squares fit to the level two of combined displacements. These include the estimated co-seismic offsets, horizontal and vertical station velocities, residual displacements, and weekly displacements. The level four products are grids that are created from the level three ESDRs. Shown on the left are level three steady state or secular velocities for about 1500 GNSS stations in Western North America. These have been established through a variety of projects and institutions shown at the bottom of the slide. On the right are Southern California velocities demonstrating the transition from the North America to the Pacific plate, over hundreds of kilometers across the San Andreas fault system. The westernmost stations have velocity of about 50 millimeters per year, trending to the northwest. The red circles show significant earthquakes that have been observed over the period of our collaboration. The most recent one is the magnitude 7.1 2019 Ridgecrest earthquake sequence, sequence in the same tectonic regime as previous magnitude 7 events in 1992 1999 and 2010. We estimate daily the changing positions of all the GNSS stations in horizontal and vertical directions. After averaging the positions over a week and removing the linear motions of the stations, we see in this video the accumulating nonlinear motions from 2010 to 2020. These motions are over and above the steady tectonic motion represented by the horizontal velocities that I showed in the previous slide. The transient motions include post-seismic uh, motions for four large earthquakes as the Earth's crust relaxes back to its earthquake, uh, to its pre-earthquake state. The most pronounced changes correspond to those after the 2010 magnitude 7.1 event, which permanently displaced every station in Southern California. Note the outward pointing horizontal motions that result from the inflation of the Long Valley Caldera. Here are the accumulated transient motions shown in the previous slide. Identifying the transients improves our understanding of plate boundary deformation and fault processes and assessing associated seismic and other hazards. This video shows the accumulating weekly vertical displacements, which are in the most part highly non-linear. Transients are primarily due to groundwater usage, drought, vertical tectonic motion, and volcanism. Piecing all this together, we currently publish weekly grids of steady and nonlinear horizontal and vertical motions. Shown here are vertical displacement grids at August 20th, 2021, showing accumulated motion since 2010. Note the transients due to the Ridgecrest earthquakes in the east and north components atop the steady tectonic motions and subsidence in the Central Valley. The archived weekly displacement grids allow a user, say a land surveyor, to obtain the change of coordinates between any two dates to maintain a geographic information system. You see here level four horizontal maximum shear strain rates on the left and dilatation rates on the right over a period of 1999 to 2018. The movie starts just prior to the 1999 magnitude 7.1 Hector Mine earthquake, and then shows the strain rates for a series of large earthquakes that are coming up. You'll see them 2003 and 2004. 
and 2010 and 2014. You'll notice large strain rates after each earthquake. Strain rate grids are independent of a specific geodetic reference frame and are good indicators of the buildup of stresses in the crust over the crust of the formation cycle leading up to earthquakes. This level three product consists of 32 episodic tremor and slip or ETS events from 1994 to 2021 in northern and central Cascadia. As measured at station ALBH in Western Canada, ETS events occur with a period of about 14 months and an amplitude of only several millimeters. The sawtooth pattern is so small that it was not known to be happening until we had these ultra precise GPS measurements. The ETS events are estimated and modeled based on the residuals from the parametric model fit to the level two displacement time series. Shen Liu at JPL is the lead on this part of the project. On the left is the horizontal surface expression of the ETS event at GNSS stations in 2019. The video shows the model transient motion for this event as it propagates across the network. I'm going to replay this movie a few times. Superimposed on, in red are the earthquake tremor and events. The discovery of ETS here and in other subduction zones gives us insight into the earthquake physics and the possibility of improved forecasts of great earthquakes and the great tsunamis that accompany them, such as in 2024, 2004 in Sumatra and 2011 in Japan. However, the underlying geophysics is still not totally understood and is the subject of active research. Our level four products include total water storage over North America. Donald Argus at JPL is the lead on this part of the project. We can measure the change in vertical displacements when the weight of the water in lakes increases and presses down and when water is drawn out from under the ground aquifers and the ground above sinks. Total water storage is affected by change in weather and climate, precipitation and groundwater extraction policies. Significant differences can occur between total water storage and fur from GNSS vertical motions, as shown on the right, and those predicted by hydrological models. Excuse me. For example, in California's mountains, more water is lost during periods of drought and gained during consecutive years of heavy precipitation. This suggests that the models need to have a greater capacity for the ground to store water. The graphics on the upper left show GPS uplift and corresponding water loss in the Western US during the period of harsh drought between October 2011 to October 2015. The graphic below shows the cycle of drought and heavy precipitation from 2006 to 2019. This movie shows monthly changes in total water storage from January 2006 to December 2020 and comparison with NASA's gravity recovery and climate experiment or GRACE mission. Our hydrology products have a spatial resolution of about one degree or less depending on the spacing of the GNSS stations thereby complementing estimates of total water storage from GRACE with a spatial resolution of about three degrees. Another level three product consists of seismic velocity and displacement waveforms. Seismogeodesy is a method to optimally combine high rate GNSS and strong motion accelerometer data. It is most useful for earthquake and tsunami early warning by providing rapid earthquake magnitude estimates. Unlike traditional seismic instrumentation, 
It allows for observations close to the earthquake rupture. It measures the permanent co-seismic displacements. Yeah. Uh, allowing a rapid model of the movement along the rupturing fault and doesn't saturate a magnitude greater than eight. Saturation means that using seismic data alone, it is difficult to rapidly distinguish earthquakes of say a magnitude eight or nine. I'll show how this ESDR contributes to rapid earthquake magnitude estimation suitable for local tsunami warning. The next few slides will present three examples of the use of the project's ESDRs. Ocean-based wide tsunami warning is well established. Not so for local tsunami warning. That is, for coastal populations nearest the causative earthquake, GNSS and seismogeodesy can play an important role here. Rapid modeling of large subduction zone earthquakes, in particular the estimation of magnitude and fault mechanism. This slide shows lives lost during the 2011 magnitude 9 earthquake in Japan and the tsunami inundation heights that reached up to 10 meters and arrival times along the northeast coast of Honshu. As the video shows, turn that on. The tsunami waves arrived from 30 to 60 minutes after earthquake rupture. The Japan early warning system relying solely on seismic data severely underestimated the earthquake's magnitude. The Japan Meteorological Agency, JMA, determined the magnitude of, mag of 7.9 and issued the tsunami warning within three minutes after rupture initiation. This underestimate may have resulted in a delay of coastal evacuation. As we show in the next slide, using seismic geodetic data could have provided an accurate estimate of magnitude at the same three minute mark. Seismic geodetic measurements allows for a significantly more rapid and accurate estimate of the permanent co-seismic offset and magnitude during an earthquake compared to traditional seismic methods. An example is shown here. The top set of plots shows the 100 hertz or 100 uh, samples per second seismogeodetic data collected by a station 377 kilometers away from the epicenter of the 2011 earthquake. As these are observed in time, the vertical velocities and displacements shown in the middle plots are used to estimate the co-seismic window in the earthquake magnitude. As shown in the lower panels, the magnitude convergence to 9.08 within about three minutes of earthquake origin time, well before the arrival of the first tsunami waves. We are working with the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center in Hawaii on a seismic geodetic system for local tsunamis. Until now, we have archived high-rate seismic geodetic ESDRs at CDDIS for 10 historical earthquakes that contribute to these types of studies by being able to replay tsunami events. For our second example, this study uses our level two displacement time series to model the co-seismic and post-seismic deformation fields after the 2019 7.1 Ridgecrest earthquake in California. The top maps show the displacement patterns at the surface and the bottom plots show how the faults ruptured at depth to match the observed co-seismic displacements and post-seismic motion as the cost relaxes. This study looked at both elastic and viscoelastic models of fault slip thus contributing to an improved understanding of crustal processes and frictional properties. 
Viscoelasticity is the property of materials that exhibit both viscous and elastic time-dependent characteristics when undergoing deformation. As a third example, we highlight the integration of the level two dis daily displacements with high resolution images of the Earth's surface obtained from analysis of repeated passes of INSAR satellites. Introducing the GNSS component provides an accurate set of 3D positions tied to the International Terrestrial Reference Frame. The graphic on the left, recently produced by Zheng Kang Chen and Zhen Lu, is the horizontal velocity grid over California with the vertical velocities on the right. Note that the, note the white areas at the upper left corner of the grids. These are areas that are poorly imaged by IMSAR, indicating limitations to this approach and areas of poor correlation between repeated satellite passes. This image prepared by Professor David Sanwell's INSAR group at SIO is also the result of INSAR GNSS integration. It shows an area of subsidence in California's San Joaquin Valley. The level three measures weekly displacement time series at station P056 show significant changes in, subduction, in subsidence rates over the period 2006 to 2022 for a total about one meter that reflect periods of drought and increased groundwater use. On the upper right is the INSAR time series that are at a location for a shorter period of time. We have proposed a new ESDR for a measures follow-up proposal that would archive these displacement maps on a monthly basis. The combination of GNSS and INSAR displacements provides a high resolution map of crustal motion, an important product of the upcoming NISAR mission. You can retrieve all our products distributed in nine folders as CDIS using this link. Some products are updated weekly, others when an event such as an earthquake or transient event occurs. We've had excellent support from the CDIS team in developing and maintaining the ESDR archive for our measures project, and we are very grateful for that. Before the presentation is handed over to Angeline, I'd like to acknowledge the graduate students and postdoctoral researchers who have participated in our NASA projects to date. Thank you all for your attention. Have a good day. Okay, thank you, Yehuda, and I'll just briefly wave, wave hi here. Um, let me get the slides. Okay, so uh, thank you, Yehuda. Uh, Yehuda has taken you through um, the hierarchy of, of a lot of our products fundamentally based on station positions. And he showed you how we start by, by having the position time series of these global continuous permanent GNSS stations. And from there, we progress to the higher level products like velocity, displacement grids, transient products and products uh, describing how water is stored on and underneath the surface of the earth. I'm going to take you through uh, just uh, one more product family and it's the troposphere products. And I, I do see in the in the attendees list some some uh, old familiar uh, GNSS troposphere names. Nice to see you. Uh, but for the benefit of those who aren't experts, I'll, I'll just review how uh, we can use GNSS to determine weather. And then I'll show an example of how that can be used for a weather application and for a climate application. So how can we determine uh, weather using GNSS? Well, the way this works uh, it goes back to the fundamentals of what a GPS receiver in, in this box at the station is doing. It's very precisely measuring the amount of time that it takes for signals to travel from the satellites orbiting the Earth to the receiving antenna on the ground. And when we precisely measure the signal travel time for many satellites in the sky, 
the geometry gives us the position of the receiving antenna. But that signal travel time is affected not only by the sheer distance between the satellite and the receiving antenna, but also by the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. So the upshot of this is when we estimate the station's position, as we do to do all to generate all the products that you had described, we automatically also estimate the amount of signal delay due to the water vapor in the atmosphere. It's not even a choice. We have to do this. Now, further, if we have at the station, uh, as we see in the red circle here, uh, a couple basic meteorological instruments to measure surface pressure and temperature, that signal delay due to water vapor can be converted into precipitable water, which comes out of every weather model. Every meteorolo meteorologist uh, uses this every day. And GNSS, in fact, is uniquely able to precisely determine precipitable water near continuously. We determine it every five minutes at these stations. To contrast other instruments that are used to determine precipitable water, um, one is satel uh, weather satellites. Uh, those are excellent over the oceans, but the retrievals can be difficult over land. So in GNSS, we have land-based instruments that can very accurately determine the precipitable water. Also, uh, radio signs or weather balloons are used. Uh, these provide excellent data, but they're sparse in both space and time. Uh, they're typically launched only every 12 hours, and there's a lot of weather that can change within 12 hours, and they can be several hundred miles apart. So in these GNSS stations, we have this opportunistic data set that uh, is uniquely able to get five-minute uh, precipitable water over land. Uh, to show you an example and convince you that this is actually weather, uh, I'm going to return to a January 2005 event here in Southern California. Uh, this was memorable and sadly impactful here. Uh, at this time, it rained uh, continuously for three and a half days. And uh, I'm sure we have attendees where that would be usual, but that is not at all usual in Southern California. And uh, you can see there, this event happened on January 10th after, after the first couple of days. And uh, you can see that this freeway was, was impacted. These motorists were stranded. There was a, a railroad that, that was uh, also taken out. And sadly, there was loss of life in the town of, of La Conchita in this event too. Uh, finally, on January 11th, uh, you can see after the temperature and dew point curves are, are right together for three and a half days, uh, finally, uh, the air uh, dried out on January 11th. So, whoops. If we look at the um, GNSS determined troposphere at a site near here, uh, you can. This is on January 11th, the final day of this this multi-day uh, rain event. The final day, uh, we start out with with elevated water vapor in the troposphere. <laughs> sort of the last gasp of this event was was a strengthening. It gets even more moisture in the air, and then finally uh, a rather rapid uh, drying out of the atmosphere. So. If we take a look at this with the GNSS stations in Southern California, uh, and this this is a movie, we're starting out here in the in the deepish blues, uh, so a, a moist atmosphere, and you'll see this little final strengthening. It it goes just all the way blue here, and then there's a drying event that goes from north to south. So you'll see you'll see it progress down in, into the brown. So there you go, the strengthening and the drying north to south. So we'll see this again. So you can see this, this, this really is showing us the weather that, that happened in Southern California in this, at this time. And again, these are five minute estimates of, of the atmosphere. Now, so the ESDR that is stored at the CDDIS uh, contains both the zenith troposphere delay and the precipitable water vapor for stations that have on-site meteorological instruments. So uh, all of our 3,000 sites have the zenith troposphere delay uh, ESDR, and those with the weather instruments also have precipitable water. And uh, so the zenith troposphere delay record goes clear back to the beginning, 1992, for the very oldest stations. So here we have 
a three decade long record of five minute troposphere delay above uh, the longest lived stations. And I'm showing one in here in Australia that that goes clear back to the beginning and you see this, this multi-decade uh, record. And uh, it got a weather instruments installed somewhat later so the precipitable water doesn't go all the way back, but, but since the mid 2000s, we additionally have the precipitable water uh, record at this station. You can see they're, they're highly correlated, um, but it's, it's just a slightly different thing being measured in, in the atmosphere, but mostly dependent on uh, water vapor. And you can see a strong seasonal effect here as, as one would expect. And so again, we saw on the last slide, using just a tiny, tiny piece of uh, one day of, of this record to look at the short-term weather occurring. Here we can see that we additionally have a climate record, three decades of, of uh, atmospheric data. So these, these ESDRs are uh, stored at the CDDIS, like all the others. And I will now conclude that part of the presentation and I will give you a short demonstration of our product viewer, MGVIZ. And you saw screenshots of this in Yehuda's presentation. And I'll just bring up a couple stations here and then uh, and then we'll we'll talk about it. Um, so you, you see how um, I can bring up stations time series uh, multiple stations so i can bring up a, a couple that are pretty close together and and look to see if i see the same behavior or different behavior in in the nearby stations and um we can also uh look at the um the trended or detrended series um to to, to look at that plate motion uh, we can also look at the velocities that um, Yehuda showed uh, that we read off of those uh, trends in, in the GPS time series. Now, this system um, what is based uh, on a system developed at JPL to view data from our Mars rovers as they track around the planet and take data with their various instruments. And we teamed up with the, that team to bring this geographic information system to our own planet. So we, we thank them for that. Uh, so in the interest of time, I think I will leave that demonstration here. Um, we do have a lengthier uh, MGVIZ introduction video on our project website, which Jennifer has the URL for, as well as the URL to the MGVIZ system. And uh, with that, I think I will Thank the CDDIS for their expert and secure uh, hosting of our products and thank the Earth Data webinar team for their expert hosting of this webinar. And I will turn it back to Jennifer. Okay, thank you so much, Angeline. So at this point, I have opened the final optional polls, but in the spirit of time, what we're going to do is go ahead, because we're running a bit over, um, go ahead and jump into the Q&A. Um, I will leave these uh, end polls open for about 30 minutes. So if you want to take a little time once we're finished with the Q&A, please feel free to do that as well. So let's go ahead and jump in here. Uh, if you could give me one... One moment, I'm trying to I actually, let's see. Okay, so the first question is, um, for curiosity, I just wanted to know, and this is the question for Angeline, having GPS observables at 30 seconds, are these PWD estimations done in GAMET or some other program? And I hope I am pronouncing that acronym correctly. Uh, you, you did fine. Um, so uh, the, the products that I was des describing at, at, um, are, are done at, at JPL in, in Gypsy X. Uh, Scripts at Yehuda's uh, group uh, uses gamut, and they also estimate tropos troposphere at, uh, at, I believe it's one hour or, or 30 minutes. Uh, Yehuda can correct me. Uh, but, what, but the ESDR that we're storing at CDDIS is uh, Gypsy X based. 
Okay, thank you so much. So I am actually going to jump to the, we have some questions in the chat rather than the Q&A. So let me jump up there real quick and let's take a look. The next question is, uh, okay, so could you explain again why PW is available only for part of the time period in your example slide? What additional instrumentation was installed at this site? Uh, certainly, yeah, it's uh, surface pressure and surface temperature are, are needed to convert the troposphere delay into precipitable water. Okay, thank you very much, Angela. And the next question is, how is this hydrostatic delay modeled? Is this derived from most of the GNSS stations you process from a model, for example, ECMWF, VMF1, or a local barometer? Uh, well, that's a detailed question. Um, is that in the... That is a question Can for, I read Yahoo, that or for Yahoo. Can I read it again? Sure. It's in the chat um, rather than the Q&A. So this is a question uh, for Yehuda, and I'm happy to read it again. How is the hydrostatic delay modeled? Is this derived from most of the GNSS stations you process from a model, for example, ECMWF, VMF1, or a local barometer? We use the... Um... Vienna mapping function as part of the GNSS analysis. Yeah, and I can answer for the JPL analysis. Uh, we are currently using GPT-2, but we uh, will likely or possibly change to the Vienna mapping function at our next reprocessing. Okay, thank you very much, Yehuda, and thank you, Angelin. So the next question is, are is there a possibility for another session focused on Gypsy X or Gamut for GNSS product processing? Well, I'll answer for Gamut. Gamut is produced, um, is developed and uh, maintained at MIT. And they, uh, Tom Herring and uh, others, um, they provide uh, courses every so often for people who are interested in, uh, in learning how to use Gamut and the, um, and the, also the Globe case software that does network adjustments. Well, thank and you. And essentially very the same for, for Gypsy X. Uh, Gypsy X has uh, uh, tutorials uh, from time to time. There recently was one uh, virtual training course, and the, those videos are available to Gypsy X licensees. Well, thank you very much, uh, Yehuda, and thank you again, Angeline. And so I am just scanning both the Q&A panel to determine if there are additional questions. I don't see any in the Q&A. Let me hop back up to the chat and just ensure that I have not missed anything. Um, one of the questions, uh, while we're waiting to see if there are any additional questions from participants, uh, has to do with whether or not today's event is being recorded. Um, and I do see another question. So today's event is being recorded and I will do two things. I will send a follow-up email to all registrants. So for those uh, colleagues um, who are not able to attend, they'll receive a link to the recording and it will also be posted to the NASA Earth Data website under, so earthdata.nasa.gov under uh, learn and then webinars and tutorials. And also will be posted to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel and potentially also linked off from uh, the CDDIS website as well. But um, you know that, that we can certainly follow up with that information when I um, send my email. So I do see another um, question for everybody. Which sites other than in Cascadia have experienced or show evidence of episodic slip events, for example, Japan? Yeah, there are quite a few uh, locations now that have these type of events. They're not always um, the ETS type events, but they're in a category called slow slip events which are motions that are um, the transient motions that are not uh, picked up by, uh, by seismic instruments. So there are um, areas in, um, around the Pacific Rim in New Zealand um, and other locations, Japan, that experience these type of transients. 
Okay, thank you very Isn't much. You hit a, oh, let me just jump in. I believe uh, New Zealand is is a, a location that has BTS like events. Oh, we thought I said that. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Maybe I blinked. <laughs> if out. I didn't, thank you for adding that. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is: Is it possible for underwater mapping, and for what use, and how much accuracy? Well, there's a lot of. Uh, um, <laughs> In recent years, there's been a big effort to do what's called seafloor positioning. And there are several uh, initiatives going on. And uh, it's a proven technology where you can uh, put the transponders on the ocean bottom and uh, observe them from the surface with a, a GNSS receiver on either a, a ship or a wave glider. Uh, Japan has an extensive network of uh, of seafloor positioning sensors, and uh, I say the accuracy is about on the centimeter level for a uh, a you know a, a measurement. There is, as you can imagine, it's a more challenging environment to work with, and it's becoming. There's initiatives now to make it more uh, um, operational. Especially with uh, these wave uh, uh, wave, um, what do I call them? Um, these autonomous um, boats that, that will collect the, the data and send them back to uh, to processing centers. So we can envision uh, a, a, this type of of measurement on a continuous basis, although that hasn't been uh, yet achieved. Okay, thank you very much, Yehuda. We do have a few more questions that have come in. We are now in the extended Q&A period, so at 3.15, again, that'll be a hard cutoff. So if we do not get to your question, our speakers will be able to follow up with you offline. The next question is for Yehuda. Is the time, excuse me, let me back up. Is the high time resolution seismogeodetic? Yeah displacement information that you're calculating in California available for any other regions within the world? Yeah, yeah, we, uh, we have a, an archive of historical earthquakes that have been observed with um, ge geodesy and seismology. And those waveforms, velocities, and displacements at high rate are available at the CDDIS for a growing number of historical earthquakes in Japan, um, South America, Mexico, um, and other locations. So that information is then available for people who want to, say, replay these, these events in order to develop whatever system or software that they're um, they're developing. So yes, they're, uh, they're available. And uh, as new earthquakes occur, um, the data are then uh, archived at the CDIS. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is, how close do you think we are to including CDDIS products in commercial processing software? Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it's already being used. I'm not sure, but I know that the archive that we maintain at, at IGPP here at Scripps or the, the SOPAC archive is used uh, in, is built into commercial packages that do surveying. So I would, I'm not sure about CDDIS, but I would expect that there may be some commercial use. So can you hear me? This is Pat. We we do have a lot of commercial organizations that uh, use the CDDIS data in a myriad of different areas of products that they create for themselves and for commercial sale. So yes, the, your your question is yes, there are already commercial organizations out there doing that and have been for quite a while. Thank you very much, Pat. Uh, the next question is, I'm working on using machine learning for prediction, 
for predicting troposphere delay in Egypt, but there is no coverage of IGS stations over Egypt to use. Uh, I guess it's more, excuse me, but is there no coverage for of IGS stations over Egypt to use tropospheric products? As, as far as I know, there aren't um, many stations in Egypt or in that, that part of the world. Um, there are stations, in, quite a few stations in Israel that could be useful for uh, studies in Egypt, but I would um, encourage uh, the person who, may, who, who uh, raised that question is to try to get more, uh, some more stations in that area. Now, the IGS distinguishes between regional networks and the IGS network. The IGS network is based on a few hundred globally distributed stations. But we process um, thousands of stations around the world. And so uh, there are a lot of regional networks that have been uh, developed in uh, here in California, New Zealand, Japan. And so these are regional uh, efforts. So I would encourage uh, the listeners to to promote that kind of activity in their uh, areas. But there, is, as Angie mentioned, there's plenty of data from uh, stations around the world uh, to uh, test machine learning uh, um, algorithms and the methodology. So this, this is Pat. I'll make a plug here for the IGS. Uh, as, as Yehuda said, we do not have coverage all over the world. It's not designed specifically to have uh, a very dense network throughout the world. It's, it's specifically set up the way it is for some other reasons. But if you're interested and you know of people that have receivers, science grade receivers in that area, please have them reach out to me and I can get them in touch with the appropriate people to IGS to evaluate whether that's something that we would be able to bring into the network. Yeah, that would be very useful because that's, as I said, there is there aren't many stations in that part of the world. Thank you to both Pat and also to Yehuda. Our next question is, is there any freeware for post-processing raw GNSS data or RINEX files? Well, I know the gamut uh, software, they, they license the software to um, to academic users or people who are doing research for free, they just have to register and and they also, they, they charge a fee for non-academic users. But you should contact them and Tom Herring and uh, Mike Floyd at MIT. Okay. There's also online tools to do positioning. Um, there's some at the National Geodetic Survey, there's a, um, an, uh, an application in Wuhan, China that allows you to do point positioning. So there are services where you can just uh, upload your Rhinex data and get a, uh, a solution. Okay, thank you, Yehuda. The next question is, and this is one is actually directed towards you. For Yehuda, which method is used to create the surfaces that represent the transient de deformations or velocities seen on some of the maps? If they used Krigging or least squares, et cetera. That is a good question. There, there are many ways of, uh, of gridding, as, uh, as people know. And we use the process of um, um, that's developed by um, um, David Sandwell's group here at um, at um, SIO, which introduces the elastic properties of the crust in order to do the um, the, the uh, gridding. So yeah, there is quite a few methods of doing that. Okay, thank you very much. And another participant did post into the chat a link to a free GNSS processing software, which I have added in response to that question in the Q&A. 
Um, so hopefully the participant can see that as well. And so let me move up to the next question. The next question is, is there a Goldilocks density figure for cores locations over the ground, for example, 50 kilometer spacing to enable support of these products? Well, there's, um, it depends on application. Because in uh, California, the West Coast, there are many geological faults. And so the distribution of stations is, is quite, quite high, the density, sometimes up to you know, 15, 20 kilometers. That really depends on the application. If you're just doing, let's say, like RTK positioning, it could be you know, several tens of kilometers would be ideal. But it really depends on the application. Okay, so the next question, um, I think, you know, was covered a bit earlier because um, both you and Angelin had mentioned, mentioned that the host facilities for the GAMET program do provide training and tutorials. But uh, the question is, are there any videos explaining the use of the GAMET program because it is a scientific program, not a commercial program? So are there any that... Um, either of the speakers are aware of that we could perhaps share here. I'm not sure about that. I have to contact the people at MIT. Um, I know that they give, there's a lot of material that they, that they use for their courses. I'm not sure if there's a, a video version of that. Perhaps some of the, the classes have been recorded. I'm not sure. Okay, and so I am going to, a couple of, of the participants have placed into the chat, which I don't think everyone can see, so I will place it in the um, Q&A as well. So apparently there are some tutorials available through the UNAVCO site, and uh, so mm -hmm. I'm going to place that now, and we'll continue on to the next um, The next question. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, let's see. The next question is, I have, uh, let's see, how is the scenario of development of single frequency GNSS for equivalent results on par with dual frequency GNSS? Um, well, I wouldn't recommend it, but there are people who, who are looking into that. Um, using um, the GPS data to compute velocities. And from that, um, using single frequencies, but most of the work is do done with multiple frequencies, especially now that there are so many constellations that it's becoming pretty standard um, to use multiple frequencies. And I would think that, that commercially the, that's being used more, that multiple frequencies are being used. Thank you very much, Yehuda. We have only a couple of minutes left here, probably for, um, let's see, one more question. <clears throat> I wanted to know the integration of GNSS and INSTAR time series for deformation analysis, whether they are correlated to one another or to each other. Um, well, they're, the reason, the benefit, I mean, it's, it's benef benefits of combining the two. One reason is that the INSAR measurements are performed in, in the line of sight to the satellite, while the GNSS is performed in three dimensions. So GNSS provides a you know, backbone to convert um, in the images, the combined images, into a north, um, into horizontal and vertical components. I showed one of the examples of. Uh, of the velocity maps that were developed for California. So um, 
but you can consider them pretty much in independent measurements. But they're, they're of course, they're, uh, they go through the same atmosphere. They go through the same ionosphere. So there's definitely uh, correlations between them. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we really, we are out of time. There were, I'll just address this very quickly, and then I'll certainly, I will leave the virtual meeting space open another 10 minutes or so for those who may have input on the polls or just have, you know, thought of additional questions for our speakers. So uh, for the speakers, are you, I know that you have your email addresses in the slides, um, but I wondered if I could share them also in the Q&A for those participants who might be interested in following up with you offline. Oh, absolutely. Is, is that fine with everybody, uh, Angeline and uh, Pat? Uh, yes, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. Okay, wonderful. So I will do that in just a moment. At this point, what we will do, I'd like to thank our speakers. Pat, I'm sorry for your um, difficulty in joining. And thanks to all of our participants for your patience for a couple minutes there at the very beginning. Um, I I'm, was happy to see everybody here. Thanks to our speakers. Thanks to all of our participants. And uh, we'll leave the virtual space open, but again, log off from the audio component. Are there any final remarks from our speakers? If not, we will end this afternoon's event. Thank All right. You, Jennifer, and thank, thank you, CDDIF. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. For the oh. organizers and the participants. You're quite welcome. All right, so thanks so much, everybody. At this point, we'll log off from the audio component and uh, I'll leave the virtual meeting space opened and uh, also include their email addresses. So give me just a second and I'll put that right in the chat for everybody. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. All right. Goodbye Thank now. Thank you.